Good morning, everybody. Hopefully, uh, you're off to a good start on this Sunday morning. Uh, if you've had uh, your bowl of Fruity Pebbles, save one for me. Uh, we're about out of uh, Frosted Flakes at our house, but uh, I'll find something to eat when I get home. But I do just want to, uh, again, say good morning. I want to fill you in on a few things that have been going on around here. Uh, many of you have heard, and you're looking forward to, just like I am, to see what the governor has to say tomorrow about large groups and specifically worship gatherings. And I will tell you that uh, the deacons and I have met this past week and we're formulating a plan, all of that contingent on what we find out tomorrow. But uh, look forward to hearing something from us tomorrow, one way or the other, giving you some specific plans. Uh, one of the ways that that's gonna happen is uh, I'm gonna be emailing out a new update, an IBC update. Um, it will have uh, the updated plans for what we're going to do moving forward as far as our meetings together. But also it will have in there uh, the new Bible readings for the month of May. Now some of you, uh, you may have already gotten them in the mail, if not be looking for them tomorrow. Because we sent out a survey along with your Bible readings uh, in the mail so that you can have those. Now regarding the survey... Uh, please, please, please be looking in your mailbox for these because uh, it, it won't take you very long. But what this does is it helps us figure out where you are. Uh, we're very well aware that just because the doors may open back up, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be rushing here and eager because there's still some fear out there. And so what we're wanting to do with this survey is figure out exactly where you are in all of this. Uh, what are your fears? What are your concerns? And so if you would, when you get that in the mail, just take a couple minutes, fill that out. It's multiple choice. There are no wrong answers. Uh, fill that out, put it back in an envelope, and send it to the church so that we can have that and start making plans uh, specifically moving forward. And I do want uh, you to think about something this morning. And right here in the comments, uh, you can, as always, you can welcome one another. But here's what I want you to be thinking about this morning. What's something that in the middle of all this quarantine, lockdown, whatever it is that you want to call it, what's something that you've been missing? What's something that you just find yourself longing for? Now, there's a whole bunch of things that I, I find myself fitting into that category. Uh, I miss getting to go sit down in a restaurant. As nice as it is to be able to drive through and still get some of our favorite meals, and especially nice to be able to share them at home with our families, I miss going and sitting down in a restaurant with uh, friends and just enjoying some time together. Uh, I miss getting to, to go and do what I want to with no restrictions. Uh, but what are some things that you are missing in this time of quarantine? Now, we're going to come back to that in just a second, but I want you to be thinking through that. Like I said, post it in the comments so everybody else can see some of the things that you've been missing. Now, if you've got a Bible with you this morning, we're going to be in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 5. We're going to be reading the first 20 verses. It's a pretty well-known story, but uh, I told you there's some things that I've been missing. Now, if you know me well, you know one of the things that I've been missing the most is baseball. Oh my goodness, I miss baseball. Uh, a lot of you know that I follow the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, I like watching them. I like following as the season goes along to see how we're doing. Hey, who's trending up? Who's trending down? Who do we need to trade? Who do we need to bring in? I just like baseball. But what some of you may not know is that it wasn't always just the Cardinals that I followed. Back in the early 90s, there was another team that I followed pretty closely, and that was the Atlanta Braves. Now, I can't tell you for sure why that was. It may be that as a kid growing up, I didn't get to watch the Cardinals on TV. We had uh, two choices. Now, David Knight, if you're watching this morning, one of those choices was WGN, and we had the Cubs. But deep down inside myself, I just could not bring myself to root for the Cubs. So that left me with one option. We had TBS, and they always played the Braves game. So that was the team that I kind of followed and rooted for in the early 90s. Now, those teams had some success. They won a lot of National League championships, then won a whole lot of World Series trophies, but they were exciting to watch. And one of the players on those early 90s Braves teams was a guy named Deion Sanders who went by the nickname Primetime. And Dion Primetime Sanders lived up to the billing. He was this elite athlete. He played both baseball and football at a very high level. And I remember watching him thinking, man, what must it be like to be able to run like Dion? What must it be like to be able to do some of the things that Dion 
could do. And as a teenage boy, you kind of get sucked in thinking he's really got it all. And it wasn't until years later that I figured out that even in the middle of Dion's success on the baseball field or football field, whatever season he was in, he was really completely empty. I read a story uh, later, Dion came to know Christ, but this is what he had to say. Dion had all the money that he could ever have hoped for. He had all the cars, all the friends, all the people, all the things that he could ever have wanted. But he said, I came to a point where I realized it was all pointless. It was all meaningless. It didn't fulfill me the way that I hoped it would. And folks, that spoke to me because I could relate to that. And I think you can too. We find ourselves, all of us, chasing all these things, hoping that they will bring us fulfillment. But what is the one thing that we really want? We want that satisfaction to say, yes, that's the missing piece. Dion sought all those things, and he tried everything he could to fill that hole. But here's what he said in his own words. There was a pleasure in my pursuit for a season, but there was fulfillment in none. Well, those are profound words. That he tried everything that he could ever think of to fill that hole to bring himself satisfaction. But none of it ever did. And this morning, what I want us to understand is the same thing that Dion eventually figured out. That the only thing that's ever going to bring you the satisfaction, the fulfillment that you're longing for deep inside is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what happens when we realize that Jesus really is all that we'll ever need. This morning, the story that we're going to look at in Scripture in Mark 5 is about a man who figured this very thing out. A man who realized that Jesus was all that he ever would need, period. And it changed his life forever. So we're going to look at that this morning. Here in Mark 5, like I said, we're going to read the first 20 verses. <clears throat> it says, They, this being Jesus and his disciples, went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had been chained, he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now time out for a second. I just want you to get this this image in your head before we move any further. Scholars tell us that with all that Jesus had been going through previously, he had just delivered the Sermon on the Mount, he's exhausted, he gets in a boat with his disciples, and they go across the lake. While they're in the lake, what happens? A storm blows up. But what's Jesus do? He doesn't panic, he doesn't freak out. Jesus speaks to the storm and calms it. And it's in the, that's the backdrop for this, that as they get to the other side of the, the lake, it's early in the morning. It's still dark. And where in the world do they land? A graveyard. Now, I don't know who the navigator, the pilot is on this boat. I'm like, dude, we got to do better than landing in a graveyard in the middle of the night after the day that I've just had. But that's where they are. They come ashore on a graveyard, and what is the first thing they see? A naked, bleeding man comes screaming at them. Folks, if I'm part of that group. I'm turning around, I'm getting back in the boat, and we're going back to the other side of the lake. But that's not what Jesus and his disciples did. And this man eventually is so grateful that they didn't because it changes his life forever. Now let's see what else happens here. So verse 6 says, When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. And the demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us uh, to, go in, to go into them. And he gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Now, time out again. 
This is extraordinary. The man comes and he eventually finds himself at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus has already told, recognized that he's demon-possessed and told the demons to leave the man. And the demons say, don't send us away to nothing. At least let us go into those pigs over there. Jesus gives them permission. They come out of the man, go into the pigs, and the pigs go berserk just like the man had and go running off over a cliff, drown themselves. Now, can you imagine being the ones keeping the pigs? You've seen this. You probably have heard the man that, that the demons used to inhabit. It just kind of became an occupational hazard that you had to be in the same area as he was. But now then, you see this happen before your eyes. Your livelihood is running away over a cliff, drowning themselves in the water. And what's your natural reaction? You are going to go tell somebody and you're going to be terrified. And that's exactly what happens. Now, we're going to see that the crowd comes to Jesus now. Verse 14 says, Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there. Don't miss that. Sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how the Lord has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis, the ten cities, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Now, that's a great story. That is an amazing story. No matter how you want to parse this, however you want to look at it, that is a great story. But the thing that I want us to get out of this story is a man who was in need, a man who was tormented, a man who was looking for fulfillment and satisfaction, found it in one place and one place only, at the feet of Jesus. And folks, in that moment, he realized forever that Jesus was all that he was ever going to need. Jesus was the one who brought him what he was looking for. Now this morning, I want us to talk a little bit. What happens when we get to that point? And I'm hoping as I'm sitting here talking to you this morning, I hope many of you are reflecting going, that was a good day. The day that I realized that Jesus was all I need, that was a good day. But also know there's some of you that you're watching this morning and you go, I am desperately seeking fulfillment. I'm desperately seeking satisfaction. And I've been just like all these other people. I've tried everything I can and all of them have left me disappointed. Well, this morning as we talk through this, I hope that you see beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus really is all you need. But what I want us to just kind of spend some time in this morning is what does that look like? What happens when we figure that out, what happens when we realize that Jesus really is all that we need? Well, the first thing that happens is this. We're set free from bondage. When Jesus and his disciples set foot on the shore and they walked into the graveyard, instantly they saw a tormented man. Instantly they saw a man who was in bondage. But I want you to notice here that this man wasn't just in bondage with chains. In fact, the chains couldn't hold him. It made a point to tell us that over and over again that they had bound him with chains, hands and foot. And what did he do? He had broken them. But it wasn't just physical bondage that this man was in. It was a spiritual bondage. And Jesus realized that immediately. He realized that the man was demon-possessed and tormented by that. And I want you to think for just a second. I've never encountered anybody, or at least that I know of, that's demon-possessed, at least not to this extent. Can you imagine what led them to this point? This was somebody's loved one. This was somebody's brother, maybe father. Maybe it was just a, a close friend, a coworker. But how did they get to the point where the best option they had was, we're going to chain him up and put him in the graveyard? Can you imagine all the steps that they had taken, all the things that they had tried, all the things that he had tried to overcome this with no success? Now, it's hard for me to even relate 
imagine what this guy was going through. To be demon possessed, but what does scripture tell us? When Jesus addresses them and asks, says, what is your name? It says, one of the demons speaks up and says, legion, for we are many. Now, if you look it up in history, a Roman legion was between four and 6,000 soldiers. So I don't know if this is a literal number that is inhabiting this man, or if it's just a name that says, there's a bunch of us here. But either way, that's what we see. And if this man is, doesn't just have a demon dwelling inside of him, he has many demons dwelling inside of him. And that had to be absolutely maddening. And so I got to thinking, well, what might that have been like? And here's something that I came up with. I want you to imagine that you go to a, a sporting event, maybe a high school football game, something like that, and the stands are full. It's an important game. Everybody's there shoulder to shoulder. And then over the PA system, the, the public address announcer says, all right, everybody, here's what I want you to do. On the count of three, you're all going to start telling me your favorite food and why it's your favorite food at the top of your lungs. Well, can you imagine the chaos that's going to ensue? It is going to be so loud you can't hear yourself think. That's what I think is going on in this man's head. From the moment that he was demon-possessed, from the moment that those many thousands of demons dwelled inside of him, I think he was just going crazy. And it says he went around the graveyard cutting himself. Now, I look at that and I go, this isn't a man who just likes to bring himself pain. This is a man who's looking for relief. He just wanted something to stop the voices in his head. He just wanted something to bring some calm, some peace to the situation. And he was willing to try anything. Can you relate? Maybe you don't have thousands of demons dwelling inside of you. But we all want peace, don't we? We all want some satisfaction and some fulfillment, and we're willing to go to great lengths to get it. This man had. He had gone to great lengths to try and find satisfaction, but all he ever found was bondage until one man changed his life, until one man stepped out of a boat onto the shore of his graveyard, and he sees him, and he comes, and he falls down at his feet, and Jesus does something for him that nobody else had ever been able to do. He calmed the voices. He quieted the noise. He brought peace and calm in the midst of chaos. Now, folks, here's a man who realized that Jesus was all he would ever need. And in that moment, his bondage was gone. He was freed. Well, this morning, you may be saying, the preacher, I've never been in chains. I've never been chained up like this guy was chained up. Well, neither have I. But you know what? We are all in bondage. Scripture tells us very plainly that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you know what that means? When I was born, from the moment I breathed my first breath and sin entered the picture, I was enslaved to sin. I was in bondage to sin. But thanks be to God that he sent a way out of my bondage. He sent the same man that this man in the cemetery, in this graveyard, the same man that he encountered went to a cross for me. And he died there. And he shed his blood so that I could be freed from my bondage. And he shed his blood so that you could be freed from your bondage. See, here's the thing. When we meet Jesus, when we realize and we acknowledge that he is all that we will ever need and we accept the terms that he gives us, we're free. He sets us free from bondage. And what we find is a satisfaction that we have been longing for from the very beginning. See, God created a part inside of us that only he could fill. And when we meet his son, Jesus, that part is filled. And we are complete. We're whole. There's a satisfaction that comes from that that we can never duplicate anywhere else. This guy figured it out. When he met Jesus, when he realized that Jesus was all that he could ever need or want, he was set free from his bondage, both spiritually and physically. But that leads us to something else that happens. When we realize and we accept that Jesus is all that we will ever want or need, gratitude becomes our natural response. I want you to notice what happened to this guy. He comes and he's at the feet of Jesus. Jesus casts the demons out. The people hear about it and they come to find Jesus. And how do they find the man? 
sitting in his right mind, clothed in front of Jesus. This was completely different. This was somebody they hadn't seen maybe in years. Maybe somebody never, some of them had never seen him like this before. But in this moment, he was changed. And gratitude was his response. It says, Jesus is going to get into the boat. Now, we're just going to take a little sidebar here for a second. Why was Jesus getting in the boat? Did you notice what the people had asked of Jesus? Leave. Please leave our region. I was talking to Natalie last night about this story, telling her that's what we're going to talk about today. And she couldn't understand why Jesus had done something nice and people were asking him to leave. And folks, it just kind of hit me that don't we do the same thing? Jesus works in our midst regularly. But maybe it scares us a little bit. It makes us uncomfortable. So maybe we don't come right out and say, Jesus, leave. But boy, we at least tuck him off in a corner and ask him to stay quiet. We know Jesus getting in the boat. He didn't argue with them. He didn't protest because Jesus is a gentleman. And folks, he's not ever going to twist your arm to make the same decision that the man made. He's there. He died for you. He loves you. He wants you to make that decision, but he's never going to force you into it. So we see here that Jesus was willing to leave, but the man was so filled with gratitude for what Jesus had done in his life that he chases after him and he says what I think would be natural. Please let me go with you. If you can't stay here, please let me go with you. Folks, here was a man who understood beyond the shadow of a doubt what Jesus had accomplished in his life. That Jesus had done something for him that nobody else could, that nobody ever could come close to. And all he wanted to do was serve this man. How refreshing is that? Do you remember that time? You remember when you first accepted God's free gift of salvation? Do you remember how you felt? There wasn't anything that you wouldn't do for Jesus. All you wanted to do was serve him. That's what this man did. But it got me to thinking. If gratitude is our natural response to accepting what Jesus and only Jesus can do for us, why don't we see more grateful people? Why don't we see more gratitude in churches around our country? Why don't we see more gratitude in us as individuals? I think there's a couple reasons for that. I think the first most obvious reason, Jesus saw this and he addressed it. There's going to be some who will say, Lord, Lord, but they have never actually realized that Jesus is all they need. They're good at religion. They're good at coming and being a part of things here, but they've never had that life-changing relationship. And so gratitude has never entered the picture. It's never become the natural response to what Jesus has done in their life because they've never let Jesus free them from the bondage that they're in. They're still act, out there actively chasing things. Folks, if that's you today, hey, you ain't have to wait for us to end this sermon. You ain't have to wait. You can pray right there where you're at for Jesus to come in and take that bondage away, give you the satisfaction that you're longing for. And I promise you, if you do, gratitude is going to be your response. But also, you know, there's others out there that you say, Preacher, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt. I remember the day fondly when I gave my life to Jesus. I remember when he freed me from my bondage. Me too. But you know what I found? There's days that I take my eyes off of that. There's days that I, I, I forget what all Jesus has done for me and I start trying to do things for myself. And though I'm never going to be bound by sin to the point I was before, it's constantly going to haunt me. Maybe we're not a grateful people because we've lost sight of what Jesus has done for us. Maybe today you just need to pause and just be reminded that he did something for you that nobody else could, not even yourself. This man paused. He's at Jesus' feet, sitting there, clothed in his right mind for the first time in forever. And I would love to know what thought went through his head as he knelt there at the feet of Jesus and his mind 
drifts back to all the years of pain and turmoil and chaos that was. And how, how many times he had pray, prayed and begged for relief. But now here it is. Peace and calm is over him. I can almost imagine as a tear rolls down his face and he looks up at the man who did it and all he wants to do is serve him. Folks, I'd love for that to be able to be said of me. That I am so enamored with the one who changed my life. I am so in love with the one who gave his life for me. That I'm willing to do anything to serve him. That that would be my attitude each and every moment of the day. When we realize that Jesus is all we need, gratitude becomes our natural response. Now there's one more thing I want us to see here. And that is, not only is gratitude our natural response, but when we realize that Jesus is all that we need, when we've experienced him in that way, we want to tell everybody about what he's done. And I want you to think again about when you first accepted Christ. As a six-year-old boy, I sat on my, dad, on my bed beside my dad and accepted Jesus. And I remember that feeling that welled up inside me, that feeling that a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. But what I wanted to do more than anything was I wanted to go out and tell everybody that I knew. I wanted everybody to know what had just happened to me. But like many of you, there were people who told me I needed to know a little bit more. I needed to learn how to do that. And folks, you're about to hear about this preacher's biggest pet peeve when it comes to ministry. We have made evangelism. We have made telling people what God has done for us something that it was never intended to be. I want you to notice here in this passage what he told the man to do. Look what he says here in verse 20. He's told him he can't go. He says, uh, or verse 19 says, Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much what the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Folks, we have made evangelism into something that Jesus never intended for it to be. You notice that he didn't say, hey, go back to your family, go back to your hometown and the people that you once knew and start sharing uh, uh, an outline with them. Uh, back in uh, probably mid-90s, uh, I went to a class that was for faith training. Now, if you're faith trained, more power to you. It wasn't my cup of tea. But here's what they taught us in faith training. It was basically a flow chart. And as you went to somebody's house and you started with the, the first question you would ask them, well, whether they answered yes or no, depending on what question you asked next. And it just kept working its way down. And to me, it felt so cold and rigid and formal because all I was doing was working through somebody else's experience. Notice Jesus didn't ask the man to go share some outline. He didn't ask the man to go share uh, Billy Graham's steps to peace with God. That wasn't what he said at all. Notice he didn't even say, go share uh, a Bible with someone. Go put it a Bible in somebody's hands and tell them, hey, all the answers you're looking for will be found right here. He didn't tell them that. He didn't tell the guy to go memorize hundreds of scriptures and go share those with somebody. No, what Jesus told him to do was what evangelism ought to really be about. Jesus said, go tell them what the Lord has done for you. Folks, I believe as Christians, we really do want to tell people what God has done in our lives. But the problem is we've convinced ourselves that we don't know enough. I'm not the right person. I'm not equipped to do that. But what does Jesus tell us right here? That the only thing that you need to be able to share God's love is to be able to tell what he's done in your life. Every single person who's made a commitment, every single person who's had an experience with Jesus can do that. We can tell what he's done in our lives. You may not be able to tell all the scriptures in the world. You may not know John 3, 16. You may not know the Roman road, but you know what Jesus has done in you. And you can share that. And that's what he called the guy to do. And I know what you're thinking. But preacher, does that really work? I mean, that sounds so simple for that to be the formula. That can't work. 
Well, notice what happened when this guy shared. It says he goes to the Decapolis, the 10 cities, everybody that he would have ever met or ever rubbed elbows with, he goes and starts telling them what Jesus had done in his life. And it says, and all the people were amazed. All the people were amazed. And all it took was for him to share what a difference Jesus had made in his life. Folks, what has Jesus done in your life? What is it that he's done that you can tell people, look what he's done in me. I can't tell you all the ins and outs of how he did it. But he did it. That's what a lost and dying world needs to hear. That's what a world in desperate search of fulfillment and satisfaction needs to hear. That there's only one place that they'll ever find it. Because I found it in a man named Jesus. Folks, are we going out? Are we sharing our stories with people? Are we telling them what God has done in our lives? Because if we do, I believe wholeheartedly that we'll see the same results that this man did. People will be amazed because they're looking for the same things that we were looking for. And they want it. Are we sharing? I told you at the beginning of this, we're all looking for satisfaction. We're all looking for for fulfillment. And if we're honest, we've looked for it in a lot of different areas and been disappointed and disheartened all along the way. Maybe it was in family. Maybe it was in relationships. Maybe it was in a job, a career, money, whatever it is that we chased. It may have been fun for a little while, but it was never what we really, really wanted. It's only when we have that relationship with Jesus that we find the fulfillment that we want. This morning, do you have that relationship? I hope so. Some of you this morning, it's not that you need to have that relationship. You've already got it. But maybe this morning it, it struck a chord with you that, yeah, there's people that God has laid on my heart to share my story with for years now, but I've resisted because I didn't think I knew enough. Maybe this morning the thing that you need to take out of this is that Jesus really is all that I could ever want or imagine, and I want to share that with somebody else. I'm just going to tell what he did in my life. Maybe you say, no, I, I'm still in bondage. I, I'm one of those guys that you're talking about, preacher. That, yeah, I've heard about Jesus. I've read about him. I've been in church, but I've never given my life to him. And so I still feel empty on the inside. Well, today, maybe that's what you need to do. I'm not going to say maybe. If that's where you're at, this is what you need to do. You need to give your life to him. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed you'll find the satisfaction that you've long wanted. But then again, maybe you say, no, I have that. I know I have that. But boy, when I look in the mirror each day, I see somebody who is bitter and disillusioned and not at all grateful. Today, I'm just going to remember what Jesus did for me because I want gratitude to be what comes out of me. I want that to be what people see of me today. Maybe you just need to be like the man. Just pause. Sit at Jesus' feet and reflect on the difference that he made in your life and see if it doesn't give you an attitude adjustment. Jesus really is all that we could ever need or want. And my prayer is that each and every one of us know that beyond the shadow of a doubt today. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now. Lord, I thank you for your son. Lord, I thank you for the difference that he made in this man's life, that the change that he profoundly made in him. But God, I, I thank you that he made that same change in me. No, I've never been the one that's been chained up physically, running around a graveyard. But God, I was in bondage. I was shackled by my own sin. And what your son did on the cross made it possible for me to be freed and enjoy the satisfaction of a relationship with you. Father, right now I pray for each and every person who's watching this or listening to this, that God, if they've never met you, that God, today would be the day. That, Lord, they would realize that it's not chasing and all these other things that leave them empty. That, God, it's only in finding your son that they're going to find fulfillment. Lord, I pray that we would be filled with gratitude as we reflect on what your son did. Lord, I pray that as we're filled with gratitude, we are moved to go out and share what you've done in our lives. Because, God, I still believe that people are amazed by that story. God, I don't know what all you need to do this morning. 
God, I pray that you'd have free reigns in the hearts and minds of each and every person tuned in today. Lord, we love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, again, it's good to have you on here this morning. Keep an eye out for email, and uh, we'll probably post some messages to Facebook as we come up with further details. But I'm hoping to see you soon. Talk to you later. Bye.